This, this is the DiPietro, Canty, and Rothenberg podcast. I'm a big star, you know. Listen live weekday mornings from 5 to 8 a.m. on 98.7 ESPN in New York. The ESPN app, the TuneIn app, or on your smart speaker. Hey, Alexa, play ESPN New York 98.7. One pick and a Super Bowl champ with the man they can't seem to stump. Do something dumb, that's an observation. See our team make him need to run. That's Lawrence Taylor! I'm trash, DMT for short. Wonder if we best, want you peep the score. Sports Center Re, gonna be top stories of the morning. While you're yawning, grab your coffee, rise and shine with 98 7. This is drive time. We provide highlights from your favorite teams. Dave, Chris, and Rick making plenty of picks. It's Rule 76. Oh, yeah! It is Tuesday, 10th day of August, 2021. What is going on, everybody? Dan Grass and Mike Tannenbaum once again sitting in for the guys' DCR. They'll be in for the K-Show a little bit later on today here on 98.7 ESPN. 800-919-3776 is the telephone number. RJ Santillo, Ray Santiago, part of the program as well. At the controls, producing things. Mike T, good morning. Day number two. How are you feeling today, my friend? All right, then. I guess we did well enough where, uh, you know, if we were on a one-day tryout, we, we, we just doubled our production here. So good to be back with you. Absolutely. Yeah. If it's the one day contract or whatever you want to call it, the one day audition, we came back. They asked us for a day number two. And I, I guess even for the next couple of days, which is very nice and looking forward to it here. How, how does now I, I know that you, you know, you a little bit of an early riser because you do the morning TV thing on occasion, but maybe not this early. How, how's the body feeling day number two part of this routine? Yeah, Dan, that's a great point. Um, the, the three thirty wake up call is a little bit uh, earlier than usual. So, uh, we're doing good. Uh, fortunately, I have my uh, X2, which is my uh, all-natural, healthy endurance drink that I, that I take, and uh, it's helping me get through the morning. How about yourself? I, I feel good. Now, is that a little product placement there with the X2? Is there, are you like one of these like Instagram influencer people with the with the product placement stuff sliding in there? I like that. I like yeah. that, Michael. Yeah, that, that that is. It's actually it's a product I believe a lot in. But uh, story for another day. But anyway, uh, all good, ready to go, and a uh, lot to get to in the world of New York sports today. Absolutely, there is. You know, we're another day closer to the start of the preseason, which comes your way Saturday night, at least for the locals here with the Giants and the Jets. And it's a game that we will have right here on 98.7 ESPN beginning at 630. Uh, our coverage on Saturday night. It's a giant home game, but still, Jets, Giants, Battle for New York. You were a part of many, many. Now, let me ask you a question because just we're on the subject and we'll get into a little bit uh, more as we move forward with the football. Everybody says it doesn't matter. It's an exhibition game. It's a preseason is there a little bit more anteed up for the giant jet preseason game each and every year, even though it's an exhibition? You know, it's interesting. Yes. Yes. And no. When it's like back in the, when it was the third preseason game, Dan, and it was ones versus ones, there was no doubt. It was a little chippier, a little bit more competitive. I remember we had just signed Bart Scott. And as I said, Tim McCarthy and I have something in common. We, we both yes. overpaid Bart. Um, but he, <laughs> Great line. He, <laughs> yeah, he forced a fumble against Brandon Jacobs in a preseason game. And I got to tell you, Dan, it like just changed the whole complexion of the game. And, and and you could just feel it. You could see it on both sidelines. It got very chippy, very competitive. And, you know, for a number of years, it was very fortunate. You know, the Giants obviously won a couple of Super Bowls. We were in the playoffs a number of times. So both teams were kind of rolling. And um, those games were competitive. Really, I would say like, more so like in the first half when, again, it was like good against good because traditionally right. it was that third preseason game. Um, I think things are a little bit different now because, you know, it's 3-17. and 17 And I think what's really interesting, Dan, is if you and I were having this conversation a week from today and we got through that first slate of preseason games, I'm very curious. Like we heard Ron Rivera come out and say, hey, Ryan Fitzpatrick's playing. Ryan Fitzpatrick, you know, is an older veteran guy that – obviously knows what to do, went to Harvard, yet, and he's playing. And then you have someone like Sean McVay come out and say, hey, Matt Stafford, he's not even seeing the field. So it'll be interesting to see how all 32 teams handle this. 
And I remember, you know, one of your guys, of course, and now he's in the Hall of Fame, Curtis Martin, uh, you know, in an era when we started to trend towards the star players, you know, the, 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 the guys you count on so much, you know, when we started to slowly transition into those guys barely seeing the field during the preseason, Curtis is one of those guys I remember always being adamant saying, no, I, I want the reps, I want the carries, I want to play in the preseason because it gets me in the groove once the season starts for real. And, you know, unfortunately, the the way things are trending, the fact that now we eliminate a preseason game this year, Mike, we're only down to three. I, I, I just think in an era where, you know, we don't see many of the regulars during the exhibition season anyway, I think it's even going to be even more infrequent probably moving forward here. Yeah, and, and again, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. You know, it, it's interesting. I, I'd love to ask Saquon Barkley a question, which is, you know, if he had his druthers, would he want to play in a preseason game? And, and here's why I'm asking that question. It, in my experience in the NFL, oftentimes when players are coming back from an injury like a Dak Prescott, like a Saquon Barkley, like a Nick Bosa, the last and, and most meaningful hurdle is the psychological one. So yep. they'll be cleared by the you know the medical staff, the doctors, the trainers. But a lot of times, like players have told me, Dan, like, hey, I need to get hit. I need to go to the ground and I have to get up. And... You know, if you would ask Joe Judge or Kyle Shanahan uh, or Mike McCarthy, obviously they're dealing with a, a different deal right now with Dak. But I think a lot of those coaches would tell you those players want to go through that before opening day. Yeah, and I, it's funny you mentioned that too because I was reading the you know because Saquon met the media yesterday. He was cleared for action. He was off the pup list, uh, and we'll get into it as I said a little bit later on. But I was reading the transcript of his you know conversation with the media after practice yesterday, and I think that that theme was driven home pretty significantly, like you alluded to. It's one thing to be cleared and you could go out there and practice, but just to have that peace of mind, right, to be able to know that okay, now I'm going to have to be in pads, and now I'm going to have to juke out a defender potentially. I'm going to have to follow my lead block. And, you know, can I make the significant read that I'm used to doing? It's it's all about the practice reps and it's about like kind of that muscle memory, as you said. But I, I think there is a little bit of that peace of mind that you would have to have to know that, hey, I can do this because it really is a leap. And, and I'm speaking for someone who never had to do this you know, on a professional level, of course, as a, as a football player. But it's one thing to be able to do it during practice and on the sidelines when you know it's your own teammates and they're not gunning for you. But when you step out in a real game situation, and let's just say potentially Saquon doesn't get any action until the season begins in September, and then you know that you got 11 guys on the other side of the field that are coming after you at all costs. They don't care that you just missed an entire season or whatever, or rehabbing from a knee injury. They're coming out there to get you. So to not have that contact, to not have those game reps... I personally would think that you'd probably want to get that out of the way before the season starts for real, but we're going to have to see how the Giants operate this, as you said, because I think it's on a case-by-case basis with all these teams. Yeah, and I think it's a player-by-player basis, you know, where they are, what position they play. Um, you know, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, and again, I think this is kind of interesting from a fan perspective, which is, do you have some of these scripted scrimmages where, again, you know, and I think they'd be regional in basis, so the Giants and the Patriots, the Jets and the Eagles. And I think there's sometimes, Dan, you can have, again, take Saquon, right? He's doing pass protection live, or there's some sort of like drills where they're hitting, maybe not going to the ground, but something where you can simulate, you know, the contact and physicality of our sport where, uh, again, it may not be ideal, it may not be perfect, but it gives the uh, player the best chance to be, as battle tested as possible, you know, going into that first game. Because again, I think it's one of these things where um, it's not going to be whether or not they're cleared physically, because that's going to be clear. You know, there's, they're going to have enough tests about, you know, their explosion and certainly like their strength, one leg compared to the other. But it's been my experience that that last and most meaningful hurdle is the psychological one. Now, it's funny. I mean, we're going to start to get our answers here pretty soon, but I wonder. The fact that we do have the one less preseason game, because as you said, like back in the day, you know, historically, that third preseason game when we had the four game format, the third preseason game was always that one where the starters played the most, you know, they play into the second half and that sort of thing. Now, the fact we only have three games, are teams going to treat that second game as maybe the ones that the starters play the most? Or is that third game going to be approached a little bit differently now as opposed to just being, oh, the last one where you're going to have guys fighting for roster spots exclusively on the field there? I, I wonder how these teams are going to approach that this year, given it's the first time, which is the three games. 
Yeah, I think you're probably going to bifurcate the roster, which is, and this is really where the sport's going to be candid. You know, there, there are certain, and look, we could talk about either team, you know, with the context here, right? But if, for example, um, you're the New York Giants, there's certain players that just don't need the reps. That uh, like right. Leonard Leonard Williams is ready to go. Like he he's a veteran. He's a good player. How you're going to get him ready to go is going to be different than Aziz Ojolari, who is a rookie. He's going to have a lot of different responsibilities between pass rush, pass drop, special teams, kick coverage, and it's almost like they're getting ready in like very differently and. Reps in practice, reps in preseason games, I think will be very, very different. Um, and again, I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all approach anymore. Yeah, it, it's interesting because I think, look, and, and the NFL realizes this, and, and look, the players don't want to play. They really don't want, for the most part, to have to deal with preseason football. Um, I hate to say that it's a – is it too strong of a word, Mike, to say that you think a lot of players approach the preseason as an annoyance just in terms of, like, having to play the preseason games and suit up for them? I mean, do you think a lot of them just pretty much can't be bothered with them? I think it's more, uh, again, like the best players I've been around had an extraordinarily detailed schedule. So, for example, like your quarterback, Ryan Tannehill or Mark Sanchez, like they can take you through probably, like, from, like, July – Till opening day, like what they're doing, when they're throwing, when they're working on their lower body, you know, number of throws they're going to have in a practice, uh, including, hey, we're going to go into the game and you're going to play two series or you're going to play three series. Now, look, that could change. Like we always used to say that plan was etched in pencil, Dan, because, hey, you know, it just depends on do you have a three and out, do you have a long drive? But you'd be surprised. Like I think they look at preseason more of like, Hey, here's what I have to do to get ready, including playing preseason games more so than like, oh, I can't believe we have to go to another. And again, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but like uh, Zach Wilson, for example, he, he's in need of a mentor. And if you have a player, again, just to pick a name, like we talked about yesterday, a, a Nick Foles type, a Jacoby yep. Brissett type, those guys are getting ready in ways that don't have to, like we may not see their preparation in the preseason game, but they're doing a lot to get ready for the regular season. No, absolutely. I, I I agree with you. And it's those type of guys that maybe value the reps and cherish the reps during you know the month of August, let's say more so than others do. But the reason we began this whole conversation thinking about, you know, preseason and whatnot and, and, and getting ready for the season is it it was, you know, a little after we got off the air yesterday where uh we found out that Saquon Barkley was being activated. Uh and so, you know, you begin the process of him being eased back into the workload here for the Giants and for the upcoming season. And and you know, when we were talking before the show just a little bit, our little pre-show Zoom, the, you know, the specter, I think, of Barkley this year and what the season means for him and really his future with the organization, I think is an important one because, you know, you're heading into year number four as a running back, already coming off of a pretty significant injury, a surgery, a rehab, such and such, where he still hasn't gotten that second contract yet. And we all know now about the shelf life of running backs and how they're valued necessarily in and around the National Football League. And it's not to say that that Saquon isn't a good one, because we know that when he's healthy, he's a pretty damn good one, as a matter of fact. But now coming off of this injury, and really, before even he got hurt in, in, in 2020, Mike, he was banged up a little bit in 2019, which limited his effectiveness. Um this is really an important season for him, I think, when you talk about how he maybe fits long term into the plans for the New York Giants. Is that a stretch? No, I think that's fair. And, you know, he is somebody that has all the ability in the world. His character is beyond reproach. He's an incredible teammate. And he's a guy that is uh, a home run hitter, you know, and there's a premium on those players in the league, like an OBJ, where every time they touch the ball, Tyreek Hill, that they could take it to the house. And because of his character, because of his explosion, you know, he's going to get obviously a great opportunity here with the Giants. And if he comes back anywhere close to what he was, Dan, pre-injury, I think it just changes not just their offense, their team, and here's why. There's a great axiom that I believe in, which is in the NFL now, it's pass to score and run to win. And given Galladay, given Kadarius Toney, I'm a big, by the way, there's a Darius Slayton, Sterling Shepard. I I really like the depth the Giants have uh, uh, on, on offense. They should be able to put up points, assuming that Daniel Jones continues to develop. You get the ball in the second half with the lead, 
and you're trying to protect a, a young defense, the best way to do that is give the ball to Saquon Barkley. No doubt about it. I agree, and and I think that you know that's the other critical element. This in terms of what Barkley can mean to this team this year, because you know we spent a lot of time yesterday talking about Daniel Jones and how critical this season is for him. Right, going into year number three, Giants still trying to, you know, make an ultimate decision here. Is this our franchise quarterback for the next decade? Ideally, they would like for him to be, but I think that we just don't have enough information yet. A great way to ensure that Daniel Jones will be sticking around for years to come is going to be. Having all these extra weapons at the skill positions, like you alluded to, that the that the organization did do a good job of surrounding him with this offseason. Oh, and by the way, welcome back to Saquon Barkley. And having that option for you in your backfield, if you do have a lead, you give him the football, maybe bleed some time off the clock, churn out the tough yards, tire out that defense on the other side of the field. You know, a healthy and effective Saquon Barkley can be, Mike, a guy like Daniel Jones' best friend this year. 100%. Yeah. Especially when you think about the screens, the draws, all the other things that he can do. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about Josh Allen. We talked about it yesterday on Get Up, at, and you know, there's so many things that Buffalo did to help Josh Allen's completion percentage. Oh yeah, but it was it was things like Cole Beasley, and I think when we talk about guys like Saquon Barkley, those sort of like long handoffs that gives Daniel Jones help in his completion percentage. That's really good because you want the ball with Barkley in space. Hundred percent, you know, because we know that how effective. I mean, look, I understand it was a controversial pick, right? It's a run. Who takes a running back second overall? I mean, this is twenty eighteen. You know, we've had many, many, many conversations about that. But you know, one of the things that quieted that debate was how darn effective and how special he was his rookie season in twenty eighteen. And you know, then, like I said, injuries have maybe kind of curtailed his production a little bit since then. If he can go back to being, you know. 85, 90% of the guy that we saw in 2018. I think the Giants would take that, and I think that it would make a substantial difference in the performance of this offense, you know, not just here in 2021, but, you know, moving forward. And you hope that, look, Mike, if you take a guy second overall, I don't care what position he plays. And in this case, it's Saquon, it's a running back. You take a guy second overall, you want to give him a second contract. You want to keep him around and be part of your program because otherwise it's a wasted pick if he's only here for four or five years, is it not? Uh, yeah, I mean, once you get into the, the fourth and fifth year, you, you have to say, like, boy, that, that's that's a pretty good pick. I mean, you can't keep them all. Um, but you make a good point when we talk about guys like Christian McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara, Zeke Elliott. If they were going to extend them, I think this is obviously a, an important year for Saquon, you know, as you said, for a number of reasons. So um, I think it's been a good pick so far. And obviously the more that they can extend this, the better it would be for obviously both sides if it works out. But Again, I think what's interesting from a fan standpoint, you know, we keep talking about how great Dallas's offense is. I certainly think it's going to be fantastic. You know, if Barkley comes back to the way he could be, if Daniel Jones continues to get better, this giant offense should be pretty darn good. Thanks for listening to the DiPietro, Canty, and Rothenberg podcast. You're absolutely right. Catch the show on demand wherever and whenever you want. Just subscribe to us, rate us, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Mike went to bed last night. Yankee game was still going on. It didn't want to end. Uh, and then woke up this morning to find out exactly what the heck happened. And the game literally just didn't want to end. It had probably wrapped up a few minutes before the alarm clock went off this morning to do the show. But nevertheless, you know, it, they had to work for it. But the Yankees go ahead and they hold off the Royals last night. Took them 11 innings to do so. And, you know, I, I think it's one of those gutty, gritty wins for a team like the Yankees when you consider... They had a lead in the seventh inning, couldn't hold it. They had a lead in the eighth inning, couldn't hold it. They had a lead in the ninth inning, couldn't hold it. You see a theme developing here. Had a lead in the tenth, couldn't hold it. Finally, the lead that they got in the eleventh, they were able to put away, and they beat a Royals team, which, look, if you want to go to the playoffs, you got to go into Kansas City and at least take two out of three. Yeah, and here's a team that's really, you, you go over their last ten, Dan, eight out of the last ten, and look, if they could just survive the stretch with uh, what's going on with COVID, really says a lot about them and their leadership that despite all the distractions, obviously not just by the players that are not eligible, but just think about the toll it must be taking behind the scenes. The fact that they were still be able to win eight of the last 10 really puts them in a good position coming down the stretch. 
Yeah, I mean, look, and there was only, crazy enough, there was only five games scheduled in baseball last night. One of them got rained down in Chicago, so there were only four games uh, around the league. The two teams that the Yankees are chasing for the wild card, Boston and Oakland, they didn't play, so by virtue of the Yankee win, they get an extra half game on those teams. So now the Yanks are just two games behind uh, both the A's and the Sox for those wild card spots here. So you got to be feeling good. you got to be loving life uh, with the Yankees. And again, you know, Jamison Tyone, you know, they tried to get him through seven. He was cruising there through six, ran into a little bit of trouble, and they, uh, they gave him the hook there. But another impressive start for Tyone. And you talk about a guy who's turned his season around. I mean, the first couple of months, he was uh, a, a guy that you even had concerns even giving the ball to once every five days. But he has really been a, a dependable, dependable guy here for the last, I would say, couple of months of the season. He's been really, really good. Yeah, and now when you think about Cole Montgomery and now Tyon, I mean, that, that should be three front-line pitchers for them coming down the stretch. And you talked about where they are in the wild card. You know, Dan, they're only six back in the East. It's true. It's true. They're getting closer. Um, now, uh, unfortunately, like I said, you got to leapfrog a couple of teams. And the team immediately to their rear in the American League East, do not sleep on the Toronto Blue Jays. That team is playing with fire right now. Remember, Mike, they couldn't play a game, remember, for the last almost two years because of COVID. They couldn't play a game in Toronto and up in Canada. They finally got back up there. I think July the 30th was the first day that they were able to return and play in front of their fans again in Toronto. Since then, you know, they've taken off. I think they've won like 10 out of 12 or something like that since returning to Toronto. Those fans are into it, uh, even though it's only like 15,000 people that they allow into the building up there to watch them play because of the protocols. But that offense is lethal. Toronto's starting pitching is coming around here in a big way. So it's not going to be easy. I'll tell you, the last two months of the season, that American League East with those four teams, Tampa, Boston, the Yanks, and Toronto, it's going to be a slugfest. And unfortunately, you're probably going to be left with a couple of those teams who are good teams that are going to be on the outside looking in once the playoffs get here. Yeah, you look at Toronto's offense, you know, you talk about guys like Bichette, obviously led by Guerrero. This is a team that really could score a lot of runs in a hurry. I, I agree. And they're playing really good ball at home. And, you know, uh, George Springer's another guy. And yep. he was someone, look, his, his credentials speak for themselves. You know, you want to throw in all the Houston stuff and the trash cans and whatever. But, you know, George Springer's a guy who's a former World Series MVP, the guy who's thrived in big games before. And remember, the Mets kicked the tires, did more than kick the tires on him during the offseason. That was a guy that they had legitimate interest in. And I think that would have been a real high-impact bat, a guy who brings a winning pedigree uh, to that team. And, and I was certainly you know, all in for the Mets uh, bringing him aboard and having him play center field. But I guess the asking price got a little too out of hand and the Mets decided to balk. He went to Toronto here and first couple of months he was injured. Like we didn't see George Springer. And then you're like, geez, boy, did, you know, Toronto get left holding the bag a little bit with that one. But since he's come back here over the last month or so, he has been on fire. He was named the American League Player of the Week uh, yesterday. Having those guys on your team, Mike, I mean, it's like this in any sport. You know, guys who, like you said, have that pedigree and are used to winning, you know, those are invaluable, especially for a team like Toronto that's, you know, so rich with young talent and guys who maybe lack the experience on the big stage. Having the George Springers of the world, that, that, that's huge for them, especially now as you get ready to enter a pennant race. Yeah, very quietly, you know, 33 RBIs, 14 home runs in the season, hitting a solid 286. So I agree, a little bit under the radar, um, but he is a solid contributor. And again, I think offensively at home, this is a team that's going to be uh, putting on putting up a lot of runs. And again, one, eight out of their last 10. So I, I agree, I don't think we could write them off at all. Now, Aaron Boone last night in the game, he didn't stick around. See, that, that makes two of us or three of us. You know, we had to wake up early for the show this morning. So you, me, and Aaron Boone, none of us ended up sticking around for the end of that game last night. He actually got ejected uh, over a balk call, wanted an explanation, didn't get the one that he liked from the home plate umpire. So he got run here. Let's hear from uh, Booney as to why he was so upset over the balk. I just felt like, you know, he, he rolled into it and, and rolled right into his step off. And it's just such a bad rule that that, that that's a ball. And, and I just felt like, you know, as he started up, he went into his step off. I even even got to see it on replay. It's hard to pull up anything here. You're just you're watching everything on a delay. So, you know, I, pro- you know, uh, I was a little frustrated with the call the inning before. And I think it just spilled over, but probably something I shouldn't have done. 
And it was Jonathan Lewisico who ended up getting uh, called for the infraction there in the seventh inning when Boone kind of lost it and and uh, got run. Now, before the game was even played, Glaber Torres, remember, he messed up the thumb on Sunday trying to swipe a bag. Further testing showed he had a little bit of a sprain there. They put him on the injured list. Uh, what is an update on Glaber's status? How serious is it? Uh, we'll know a lot more in the next couple of days when, he's, when he sees, you know, specialists and all that. I would say last night we got – we got good news. Uh, I think we were concerned that it was going to be more serious. And, you know, as of right now, it's a, it's a sprain, sprain thumb. Um, so obviously he's on the IL. So, you know, the initial thought is that 10 to 20 days, but realistically we'll have a, a better idea in the next couple of days. And, you know, you look at, they had, you know, um, Velasco as a youngster holding down shortstop last night, which, you know, again, it's all hands on deck at this point. You're finding anybody capable that could be able to just pitch in, given all the absences that the Yankees have right now. But Luke Voigt, you know, he he struggled, of course, uh, as much as anybody on Sunday when they lost to Seattle and, you know, they couldn't get that big hit, manufacture any runs with guys in scoring position. They did a better job of that last night, Mike. And Luke Voigt single-handedly, you know, drove in the first run of the game. Then he had that solo home run in the ninth, which you thought, was going to be enough to maybe ensure a victory for the Yankees, but it wasn't to be, as we said, because they uh, gave up the lead there a couple of more times. But it was good to see Voight get into the swing of things, no pun intended, and maybe that gets his bat going a little bit here, and he could be a valuable piece for them again down the stretch. Yeah, and, you know, if you go back, I think we're also kind of burying the lead. You know, Talon start, had six strong innings, had no uh, gave up no earned runs, and uh, obviously was long gone before the game was decided. But, again, if they could stack more starts by him it just gives them a huge opportunity you know coming down the stretch so um yeah i agree those are one of those wins where uh again i i wasn't around to see the end of it but you know when you have to come back three different times to beat a good team when you're uh, on the road that says a lot about the toughness and the leadership of the yankees and tyone you know going into last night's game his previous nine starts he had a two three five era like i said like you look you look at his splits from like the the first half of the season to where we are now i mean he he's a completely different pitcher and carried it over again last night i I agree with you I think that this is a guy that now you feel good about you know you you mentioned Cole you mentioned Montgomery once they get those guys back off the covid list you pair him with tyone i, I I'm gonna pump the brakes a little bit about Severino once he is finally ready to go here because I think he is gonna be under a watchful eye just like we talked about with the Giants and Saquon Yankees aren't going to rush Severino here they're not going to give him the ball and say okay go out there and empty the tank throw 100 plus pitches you know go the distance that's not going to happen it's going to be a slow steady process which they hope by the time you get to you know late September and then if they're fortunate enough October it's a guy that you're going to have at your disposal but uh, at least with the pitching Things seem to be trending in the right direction with that starting rotation here with the Yankees, which couldn't come in a moment too soon as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and, and Dan, again, I think it bears repeating, like despite missing the top of the rotation, they've won eight of the last ten. So to do that just shows you like the, the depth. And like you said, it should get better, not worse. The, if I'm a Yankee fan, I'm encouraged because the pitching arrow is certainly uh, you know pointing straight up. And, and, and look, everybody's a professional. Um, the guys in the other team are getting paid to win as well. It's Kansas City. They're struggling this year. Don't overlook them. Take care of your business because it's only going to get a little bit more difficult from here on out, at least in the next week, because then you go to Chicago to play the Sox, and that's a first-place team, and you know they flexed their muscles again last night, and then you're coming back home, and you got to face the Red Sox. So you, know, you want to be able to get as many of these guys who are on the shelf right now. You want to be able to get them back into the mix here over the next couple of days, if possible, you know, off that COVID list. So you can have a full complement of players once you start to face those more challenging teams here when they show up on the schedule. Let's say hi to Spike. He's down at St. Pete. He's up next here on 98.7. Spike, good morning. How are you? I'm terrific, uh, fellas. I try to watch the whole game. You know, I'm I'm not much of a sleeper and I dozed off, but it was wild to me. I'll give you an analogy. The bulk rule was similar. I know, Mike, you're primarily a football guy, but you know all your other sports. It's obvious. The, ball, the interpretation of bulk rule reminded me of the catch, you know, when, when the ball would just slightly move when all this 5K crap came in, 4K. <laughs> it, 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 I watched it. I watched it over. I officiated you know, a lifetime ago because I'm 75, but 
I appreciate the basketball and, and umpire, and the, the book is a tough one. It's either, you know, it's so interpretive, like the movement of the ball. And uh, I'll tell you, I give the Yankees a lot of credit. I really do. A Tyone's pitched beautifully. And the guy that I, I bothers me that the public's all over, this is just my personality, is Gardner. Gardner signed up to be, in you degree, a fourth or fifth outfield, and maybe play once or twice a week. Am I right? Uh, in a perfect world, yeah. Yeah, so they stick him in. He's got to play every day. He's almost 38 years old, and he's what he is. I mean, he's just what he is. He's a 37 or 38-year-old guy who's been on one team, and he's trying his best, and he, and he really can't do last night. But, uh, boy, they were bringing in guys almost I didn't know. And uh, you're right. they got to take at least two out of three from Kansas City. But I don't blame Boone. You can you can watch that a thousand times and read the rule, and you, you'll get 500 different opinions on it. But uh, they won the game, and that's what matters. So uh, so we'll see what happens. Enjoy the show, boys. Keep going. Spike, appreciate it. And and the thing about the home plate umpire last night, too, ultimately signaled the balk. He was a guy who didn't even start the game behind the plate because the, the, uh, the home plate umpire, and I forgot who it was by name, um, he had to leave in the middle of the game. He was, uh, I think, some injury or something like that. So they were down an umpire with only three, and that guy uh, had to go behind home plate. Again, I, the, the name is escaping me who he is. But uh, not, not that that would excuse um, you know him calling that balk in that situation but Spike's right uh, exactly right Mike about the the Brett Gardner situation and look because of injuries he's been pressed into duty and he's probably had to play a lot more than maybe the Yanks would have envisioned at the beginning of the season and so on and so forth I, I the comparison that I use and I always say about Brett Gardner at least in terms of this current Yankee team Brett Gardner to the Yankees is what Frank Gore was to the Jets last year and it's a guy who, you know, was signed to be kind of a depth player and who probably ended up playing a lot more than he should have in a perfect situation because, you know, Frank Gore ended up getting the bulk of the carries last year for a Jets team that really didn't go anywhere and didn't do anything on offense. And, and fans were kind of like beating their head up against the wall. Why, why, do, why is Frank Gore being used as much as he is? And I think the Yankee fans probably feel the same way about a Brett Gardner at this stage of his career. Yeah, and sometimes it's interesting. Brett Gardner, Frank Gore, those players have uh, attributes you can't see, and they can impact the locker room. And again, coming down the stretch here, like I think it bears repeating, th- this is a team that's dealing with uh, more COVID issues, I think, than any team in the league right now. Um, I don't think any any other team has more COVID uh, reserves right now than the Yankees. And the fact that they had like another tough road win, missing the pitching that they're missing, winning eight out of the last ten you need contributions from guys like Gardner. And uh, I think we should recognize that this is like the second day in the row where, hey, Dan, we're getting callers from Florida. So I like the fact that, like, you know, you and I are kind of pitch hitting here, but we obviously we have a massive regional appeal that goes well beyond just the tri-state area. Well, and, and this is we're talking about different regions of the country. I mean, this is only Tuesday. I mean, in another couple of days, I mean, we might be like transcontinental <laughs> for crying out loud. I mean, we might get some calls from Europe. Right. By the time we get to Thursday, I mean, why, why should we limit ourselves? We might be getting calls from Liechtenstein for crying out loud. Let's let's do it. You know, <laughs> what's the, the, you, what's the it, capital of Liechtenstein? Oh, boy. boy what is this is like seventh grade history all over again here. Uh, I, I don't know that one off the top of my head. But think about it. In this world that we live in with technology, the way that it is, you could be in Liechtenstein listening to this program right now. Right. It's conceivable. Uh, what time is it in Liechtenstein? I think that's a six-hour time difference. I'm going to go off the top of my head. So it would be, what, close to noon. You know, you could be having your lunch, listening to you and I here on 98.7 ESPN, talking a little Yankees, old Giants, old Jets. In a perfect world, nothing's better. I mean, we could have transplanted New Yorkers taking up shop in Liechtenstein or any other place <laughs> in Europe. I don't know. Now it's bothering me. What is the what is the capital? Do we have that one? <laughs> Let me I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I think it's Vaduz, V-A-D-U-Z. It's 11. So there you go. It is a six hour time difference. I was correct about that. But as far as the capital, let's see. Um, what is it, Ray? What did you say it was? Vaduz, I think it is. V-A-D-U-Z. Mike, are you sure about the pronunciation on that one? You want uh, to take I, a word with it? Yeah, I, th- I think we give him uh, a check mark on that one. Close enough. Vaduz. Yeah. So in Vaduz, I, they actually have like listening parties. 
for this program <laughs> in fat dudes, as a matter of fact. I mean, they sell tickets to everything. You know, look, the economy over there is taking their hits just as much as it has over here. They're doing anything they can to spur revenue. So why not do a little DCR listening here on 98.7 ESPN? Thanks for listening to the DiPietro, Canty, and Rothenberg podcast. I don't wake up at 4 a.m. to wear a swim shirt. Looking for more access to the show? Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at DCR on ESPN. Dan Gross and Mike Tannenbaum here on a Tuesday DCR. We're taking it right up until 8 o'clock this morning. Damian Woody is going to join us about an hour from now from ESPN. Let's go to the phones. Mike, say hi to Matt in Queens. He's up next year on 98.7 ESPN. Matthew, good morning. How are you? Good morning, guys. Nice to hear you. Um, two quick comments. I'd like to ask Mike what he thinks the fifth most important player on a football team is. My own opinion is tight end. And I just want to state for the record, the Jets could have had Donald, Kyle Pitts, ABT, and Elijah Moore. And that team, I mean, I can't predict five years from now, but there's no question that that team was going to do much better than this year's team. Well, I, I, I mean, and Matt, thanks for the call. I mean, Mike, that's all, you know, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what would have happened between now and then. And, and also, let, let's just, if you want to speculate, you want to role play for a second. Let's say they hung on to Sam Darnold. Let's say they used that pick, you know, or, or even moved down a couple of spots to take a Kyle Pitts. You don't know if that would have affected their board moving forward. You don't know if maybe then they would have had as much of a need to even draft a guy like Elijah Moore. Maybe they would have looked to fill a different direction, maybe on the defensive side of the ball. Who knows? But look, it's nice to sit here and wonder and, and, you know, piece this guy here as opposed to there. I will say this. I don't think anybody in that building in Florham Park is having any regrets over how their draft turned out. Yeah, you know, the caller brings up an interesting point, though. If you take the uh, Miami-San Francisco trade, you're basically saying that you could have had Sam Darnold and, let's say, AVT, right? And, let's say, Elijah Moore, and probably two more ones in terms of a one in 2022 and a one in 2023. So, I guess the point is, we're going to find out how big of a difference is there between Zach Wilson and Sam Darnold, because... I think Colin makes a really interesting point. You can really just superimpose that same trade that San Fran had with Miami, and presumably they would have given up the same because they would have been going up one spot higher, Dan. Right. And and that's really like the interesting discussion. So we'll see. I do think the tight end is also a critically important position. The other person that feels that way is Bill Belichick. When you watch him over the years and how he's procured talent from drafting guys like Rob Gronkowski and – Daniel Graham in the first round. Obviously, we all know what happened with Aaron Hernandez to more recently signing both Hunter Henry and Jonu Smith. You know, when you work with defensive coaches, and I've had a charm football life when I've worked with Coach Parcells, Coach Belichick, Herb Edwards, Rex Ryan, Eric Mangini, all defensive guys, they are always trying to acquire offensive players that gave them, you know, difficulty defending. And when you see the emphasis that Coach Belichick's put on, um, the tight end position, you know, that tells you everything he what he believes in the, about that position. Yeah, and I mean, look, Kyle Pitts, you know, he was kind of the consensus going into the draft, the if you want to call it the safest pick in the draft, and a guy who, you know, the, the question was thrown out there, you know, which of these prospects has maybe the surest case of getting into the Hall of Fame one day? A lot of people think it's Kyle Pitts, and we'll see. You know, he's got to stay healthy. He's got to be in a right situation down there in Atlanta, which right now we don't have any reason to doubt that he wouldn't be. But, you know, the other thing that I think certainly went into the – whole decision to move on from Sam Darnold. And, and let's not forget, you know, they, they made the trade there with Carolina. They did get some draft capital back from them. But it also resets the clock for them financially at the quarterback position, right? Because they were going to be faced with a decision here in another year or so. Are you going to commit long-term to Sam Darnold? Or now you have at least another few years to evaluate another quarterback at the position under a team-friendly deal with the rookie contract. So I think that... I mean, you know, this is a general manager. I mean, the finances, I think, certainly played a, a, a factor into what this decision ultimately was, too, to move on from Sam. Um, yeah, I think this is a – I think it was more of a talent-based decision, Dan, from a standpoint that if they thought Sam could take him to a Super Bowl, you keep him. 
So I, I think at the end of the day, they, they made the value judgment that, hey, Zach Wilson gives us a better chance to win. And look, no one in that building will admit it, but I promise you, because I've been there, you know, when you trade away a player, you watch very carefully how well they do. And it'll be really important for them to see how well Zach Wilson plays. But let's face it, if Sam Darnold plays well in Carolina, that's not going to be a good look for the Jets. No, th- no, it's, it's not. And uh, look, but again, you can't also expect Zach Wilson to uh, duplicate what Sam Darnold is doing in year one. I mean, Sam is a fourth year quarterback now, right? He has that experience. He has that leg up on Zach Wilson. So, you know, Zach's going to have to probably experience some some, you know, rookie lumps just like Sam had to do in year one, you know, and then even as you move forward through his career, you know, he certainly had his, you know, everybody remembers that Monday night game against the New England Patriots where the cameras and the microphones got him saying he was seeing ghosts. You know, that was that was his second year. So, I mean, I don't think that you ever necessarily, you know, move on or stop learning, if you will, at the position because teams and coaches, especially the really good ones, they're always going to try to devise some schemes and some wrinkles that are going to throw you off your game. And, you know, the ones that are able to adapt, the ones that are able to adjust, those are the ones that ultimately have the really, really good careers here. Guests on DCR appear via the Goodyear hotline. Now, a quarterback, Mike, that you know, has certainly had a nice start to his career in Baltimore as Lamar Jackson. And he's already got an MVP award uh, in his trophy case. But also in, you know, less than a year, he's been stricken with COVID, not once, but twice. You know, it happened to him last year where he had to miss a game. And now he just got off the COVID list again, as a matter of fact. And um, this is someone who's not vaccinated, and he's been dealing with this virus now on multiple occasions. And it, it speaks to a bigger concern as to, given the protocols, and it, it's been an issue that's been discussed in, at great length here over the last several weeks. Now the camps are starting up again. And the NFL, while they're not necessarily mandating it, you know, it's still a personal choice if you want to go ahead and get vaccinated. Essentially, with the protocols that they've devised, They're kind of making your life as difficult as possible if you choose not to be vaccinated. And, you know, Kirk Cousins with the Minnesota Vikings is certainly somebody who's been outspoken about being somebody who's anti-vaccination. And look, that's his right. But given the ramifications and the trickle down effect and what it could potentially mean for your team, you know, I I just I, I can't imagine the challenge that it's going to be this year, Mike. And there are some of them. To be a starting quarterback in today's NFL as somebody who's not going to go ahead and choose to be vaccinated. Yeah, this is a fascinating conversation because uh, I, if you, to me, here's what's really interesting, Dan. If the NFL PA came out and said, hey, look, we're going to have an anonymous vote about mm-hmm. whether or not we're going to make vaccines mandatory, I think you would have an overwhelming amount of players, not Take, take the league out, take mm-hmm. the owners out, just players. Hey, we want 100% vaccination in the NFL this year. And if you're not vaccinated, you can't play, and we'll figure out some economic program for you. And from what I'm hearing, you know, it's a real drain on the staff and resources in terms of constantly testing and all these protocols that you already talked about. And if you had the players, again, the players vote on it because it's a mandatory term of workplace. So not yeah. to get into to all the sort of labor laws, but basically the players have a seat at the table on this. But if they had an anonymous vote at some point in the preseason, I think it'd be fascinating because what happens if this is a rule that the players pass for their own health and safety that they don't want to have non-vaccinated players in the league? What does Lamar Jackson do? What does Kirk Cousins do? It is interesting. And look, uh, you know, the number has gone up substantially just in the last couple of months. You know what I mean? Like when we broke for the summer vacation, if you will, on the NFL calendar, like once we finished up mini camps, you know, the number I think league wide was certainly a lot smaller than what it is right now. And, and, and according to the latest figures, you know, they're at 90 percent, the players in the National Football League. So the overwhelming majority have gone ahead and gotten vaccinated. But it's the, 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 the handful that haven't, those are the ones that garner the attention, right? Those are the ones that we hear about and we're constantly talking about, like you and I are doing right now here, you know, and it seems to cast this pall on, on the rest of the league and the rest of the players as a whole. And that's not necessarily fair. And I don't think that that should be the case because, as I said, 90% is a pretty good number. But 
you know, the NFL has made it known. The reason they put these protocols in place, the reason why they, you know, want players to get vaccinated, as you said, there's responsibilities, I think, to other guys in that locker room to ensure their safety, their protection, that sort of thing. And more importantly, look, the NFL is a business. It's a big money business. That's no secret. The NFL does not want to have to go through what they experienced last year with having to reschedule games at the drop of a hat, inconveniencing their television partners. You know, like the the TV partners, they pay a lot of money to the NFL to be able to air these games. And they don't want to have to have a game that airs like what we saw last year, you know, Pittsburgh, Baltimore playing on a Wednesday afternoon at four o'clock. That game is not going to get as many eyeballs as it would if it was played in prime time like they had scheduled it to be. So the league wants to keep their television partners satisfied. And the other thing that complicates matters with rescheduling games and whatnot this year, Mike, is that, you know, last year, for the most part, you didn't have fans. So you didn't have to inconvenience them if a game got rescheduled to where, you know, you didn't have to worry about a fan being able to make a game on a Tuesday or a Wednesday if it had to be played then. Now you got fans back in the buildings. Now tickets are being sold again here. So the league, let it be known, we're not playing this game again this year. We're not moving games around because uh, if that has to happen, we're going to call it a forfeit. And the team that is responsible because of, you know, guys being unable to play because of COVID, they're going to be the ones to foot the bill, both financially and in the standings, because they're just going to be given a loss, which, you know, is pretty significant here by NFL standards. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. And that's why I think if they just kind of took the gray out, Dan, and said, hey, if you're vaccinated, you have the privilege of playing. If you don't, again, there'll be an opt out. They'll get paid a much smaller amount of their salary, and maybe the league and the union, and they say, hey, we're spending so much time, effort, and money in these protocols and testing, we're going to make this really easy. If you're vaccinated, you play. If you don't, you can't. Absolutely. Um, And and we'll hear from Lamar Jackson coming up uh, as we move forward through the program here because he had some things to say. You know, he was pressed on the issue yesterday by the media down there in Baltimore about, okay, hey, you've tested positive twice now. And, you know, he even by his own admission said that it was something last year that he wouldn't wish on anybody, you know, the the symptoms that he was dealing with there. So uh, he was pressed as to whether or not he's now going to go ahead and get vaccinated, giving everything that's that's transpired here with him. We'll get to that coming up here. Uh, But right now, Mike. It's time for another edition of CMT. To cuddle. Tell you what, Rico. I can chase him down. Oh. I'll hold him down for you. <laughs> to marry. I don't want to give up the meat. Or to trash. I think I'm emotionally broken. That is the question. And a good afternoon to the both of you. Good so, good afternoon, RJ. Good afternoon, good morning. Good afternoon to our friends in Europe this morning that are listening to the show. <laughs> That's what I was going for. <laughs> yeah. Good morning. Good afternoon. I'm caught up in European time. What is it? 1248 over there. 1248, absolutely. I don't absolutely. even know where they got that from. I, I, I don't know who I'd be wishing good afternoon Shout to. out Liechtenstein. <laughs> I, don't, I really don't know where that came from. <laughs> strange things happen. You guys will find out probably tomorrow. But when strange things happen to you, your mind, your body when you get up at these hours. Oh, it happens. It's happening. But anyway, let's let's run through the, the ground rules here really quickly. So Cuddle Mary Trash, you will assign a value. You will have three options. You'll be asked a question. Mm-hmm. And you will need to assign Cuddle Mary Trash to each of the options. Mary is the one you favor the most. Cuddle is the one that you're right in the middle on, and oh. Trash is the one that you really want nothing to do with. No, so, remove it. Here we go. This one was, was posed in the group chat as a tester yesterday, and it actually carried over now to the big stage. So, Oh, this is a thing. This is a thing, right. then. Wow. The Mets... Are back in action tonight. They had a much needed day off yesterday. They're home to the Nationals. Carlos Carrasco expected to start for the Mets, who have lost four in a row. I know things are tough right now for the Mets, but I want to gauge where you're at with this team. Cuddle Mary trash these possible outcomes for the Mets this season. Mm -hmm. Will they win the NL East? Will they make the playoffs as a wild card team? Or will they miss out all together? Dan, we'll start with you. Oh, my goodness. A lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. CMT on the New York Mets. Um, I am going to say that the one that I will trash, completely rule out, completely rule out, 
is them winning the East. I, I can't see this team winning a division at all. So we are throwing that one out completely. I think that they'll never see first place again, as far as I'm concerned, the way that this season is kind of spiraling out of control. And, you know, they still have a lot of issues that are playing them right now, starting with starting pitching. So I say winning the East is trash. Um, the one that I will say that I will cuddle will be the making the playoffs as a wild card Um, because right now I just can't see any team from the National League East outside of the division champion making the postseason I think that both wild cards in the National League are still going to come from the West even though San Diego kind of been you know going through some stuff right now you know they're going to get Tatis back maybe as an outfielder no less I still think the NL West will get the three playoff teams in and the one that I am going to marry Believe it or not, which I that means I feel the strongest in, I think this team misses out on the playoffs altogether. You know, if I don't think they're winning the division and I think the NL West is getting three playoff teams, that pretty much leaves uh, the process of elimination there. I will marry the Mets missing out on the playoffs in 2021. There you go. Wow. Tough marriage. How about you, Mike? Well, I'll just jump in on that disagreement right there, guys. I'm going to say that uh, I'm going to marry the fact that the uh, Mets are going to make the playoffs, and I'll tell you why. I think the Grom comes back, and I wow. think they're a better baseball team than the Padres. So starting pitching is a little choppy right now. I don't think they win the division, so I guess that's trash. Um, but I'm going to marry the fat guys that they're going to make the playoffs this year. All right, so Mike's into it. Wow. Mike thinks this team is making the playoffs. I, we'll, we'll see what happens. A lot of it, though, hinges on the Grum. I like it. I like the optimism. All right, you guys talked about Saquon Barkley earlier. He was back at practice yesterday for the first time since he tore his right ACL last year. So I'm curious, Cuddle Mary and Trash, the following NFC East teams as far as Ooh. your expectations for the upcoming season. The Giants, the Cowboys... And the Washington football team, I am sorry, Philadelphia Eagles, you are not included. No, that would have been an easy one. Is, right. is Mike going to go first on this Let's one? Let's go I? with Mike. Mike, go ahead. All right, so you want me to go on each team here? Yeah. Well, just yes. You assign the value to wh- basically which team you think will finish the highest in the division and right on down the list. All right, we're going to go Dallas. We're going to marry Dallas because I think they win the division. Um, secondly, I like Washington, so we'll we'll, we'll say Washington's going to be. Uh, we're going to marry them in the playoffs as a wild card. Oh no! We're going to cuddle the Giants. I think the Giants are a nine and eight team, and we're going to trash the Eagles because I'm just not a big believer in Jalen Hurts. No, so the Eagles were left off. So either the either the Giants or the Washington football team will have to be trashed. Oh, well, I know. Why, why 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 can't we have? Two marries and one cuddle. Well, well, if you're into that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Mike mixing it up here on a Tuesday. I like it. <laughs> All right, well. <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting that. I, wow. I, I'll tell you what. I don't have a rebuttal for that. I'm just going to go over to Dan now and, and kind of leave Tandem. I, 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 I don't know how you follow that. I, I'm not going to try. I don't know how you that's follow that. That's a mic that. drop. That's a mic that, drop. That's, that's a mic drop in more ways than one. That's a mic drop. Wow. Oh, oh, oh. Wow. Uh, like I said, I'm still trying to gain my bearings after that one. Um, I'm, like Mike said, I will marry the Dallas Cowboys winning the national, uh, the NFC East. I, I'm going to go with the Pokes. I, I think that they're finally going to put it together this year. Dan Quinn on the defensive side of the ball is going to have those guys playing a little bit more cohesive than they did last year. Too much talent offensively. I'm going to actually cuddle. How about this? I'm going to cuddle Big Blue. I think the Giants are going to be a little bit better than maybe people are uh, are banking on this year. I think the Giants are going to keep things interesting all season long. Too much firepower on offense. I think they play well. And I'm going to trash the Washington football team. Um, I'm sorry. I am not as big a believer in Fitzmagic as maybe some other people are. I know they have a good defense. But I just think he's going to be prone to one too many mistakes again. I, I will, So I'll trash the Washington football team. That's how I see the NFC East. Why can't we have two marries and one cuddle? It's a fair question. The question of the morning thus far. That, that's a question they're, they're, they're asking all over the country of Lichtenstein right now. <laughs> I guess... I gotta tell you, there's a lot of a lot of marriages that haven't worked out where there's people asking that same question, Mike. 
I'll is- tell you something. <laughs> the, the the afternoon edition of the, the Liechtenstein Times, they're running to the printing press right now because Mike Tannenbaum has decided to uh, marry two teams in the NFC East. <laughs> All right, so another Mike, I'm not sure how he feels about the two marriages, one cuddle. Mike Sando of The Athletic, he wrote an article a little while back. He speaks to all kinds of insiders around the game, like like Mike Tannenbaum himself, GMs, coaches, and, and they rank quarterbacks just right down the list, and they put them into tiers. So the following quarterbacks, a guy you, you just spoke about, are all tier two on this list. So tell me how you feel. Cuddle Mary Trash, the following. Mm-hmm. Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, and Dak Prescott. They're all ranked almost back to back to back. So, uh, anyone that wants to jump in, but Dan, we can start with you. Well, then that would mean me then. Um, let's see. Wow. Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, and Dak Prescott. I am going to, believe it or not, I'm going to marry Dak. I think that's going to be my pick. Um, I, I, I think that, look, if he's healthy, he's proven that he could produce. He's put up numbers his whole career. I think that the reason the Cowboys haven't necessarily achieved as a team has more to do with maybe around him as opposed to him specifically. I will say, boy, this is a tough one. You know, you don't want to trash any of these guys. I'll cuddle Lamar Jackson because the guy, after all, has had multiple seasons of getting his team to the playoffs, won an MVP award, tremendous singular talent. Josh Allen might be the richest of them all after the contract he just signed the other day, but he only has that one special season. I want to see him do it for more than one year, so I'll trash Josh Allen. Yeah, uh, I'm going to say I'm going to marry Dak. I'm going to marry Josh Allen because he played that good outside of Mahomes. He may have been the MVP of the league last year. And I'm going to cuddle Lamar Jackson because I just want to see a little bit more consistency in his downfield passing. Right. So no trashing at all for Mike again. Two he's, marriages. He's, he's, a, he's a gentleman. Why can't we have two marries and one cuddle? <laughs> Thanks for listening to the DiPietro, Canty, and Rothenberg podcast. You're absolutely right. Catch the show on demand wherever and whenever you want. Just subscribe to us, rate us, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Former New York Jet offensive lineman. Now he's an outstanding analyst there on the NFL side for ESPN. It's Damian Woody. D. Wood, how's things? Good morning, gentlemen. Everything is good. Well, I'm sure you've been keeping up with the news here uh, regarding Zach Wilson last couple of days. He had the, uh, you know, I I would say the open practice on Saturday night to mixed results. Much ado about nothing? Or are we just looking for a story? Or how concerned should we be about a young quarterback kind of struggling like that at MetLife Stadium? Uh, You know what, man? It's, you know, I think people are just fishing for a story right now. Because if you look, and, you know, I've I've done some digging because I've, you know, seen some of the narratives already play out. If you look, Patrick Mahomes had the same type of stories coming out, you know, his rookie, you know, his rookie training camp. Uh, Justin Herbert had the same type of stories where they were struggling, looking bad and all those type of things. And so, uh, listen, they're rookies. They're going to go. They're going to have ebbs and flows. They're going to have ups and downs. That's just a part of training camp. So, you know, we haven't even gotten to one preseason game and, and, you know, some are panicking and all those type of things. I, I'm just like, it's a process that these rookie quarterbacks have to go through. Yeah, D. Wood, what uh, advice would you give Zach Wilson just in terms of the environment, the market, and if you were mentoring him, what would your message to him be? Well, my, you know, my T, you know this as well as I do, is you got to ignore the noise. You know, there's a lot of noise in, in the New York market. And, and I'm sure, you know, some some people have already told him that, but you know, you just gotta be you gotta take things day by day. Don't worry about what the you know talk radio is saying and all this other chatter that goes on in, in this market because there's a lot of noise. Just focus on trying to be better, you know, day in and day out. Just continue to work that way and everything else will take care of itself. You can't you can't you have to control the things that you can control. You can't control all the outside chatter. Now, you were in this situation during your time with the Jets blocking for a rookie quarterback when Mark Sanchez came along here. And and not that you're going to go about doing your job any differently, Damian, but 
Is there a little bit different feel? Like, do you have to almost kind of keep reminding yourself that, oh, this guy is lacking experience because he is a rookie and, you know, he doesn't have as many reps as maybe an established quarterback would? So do, do, do you approach things any differently knowing that you got a rookie back there? Well, listen, I think the mandate, you know, um, you know that, that first year with Mark Sanchez was, listen, we got a high draft pick at the quarterback position. But it's not going to change the identity of what we what we're trying to do. We're going to run the football and we're going to play great defense. That was our that was our mantra back in 2009, and uh, we led the league in both. And uh, that 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 helps a young quarterback out tremendously when he has a solid run game and a solid defense behind him. And I think uh, you know I didn't think about it consciously, but I just went about doing my job like everyone else uh, on both sides of the football. So. You know, I'm sure, you know, Robert Sala is just, you know, just saying to everyone, we need to preach patience because we have a very, very young team and it's going to take time for everything to come together. Well, what else um, do you like about this team? You know, they've made a lot of changes in the offseason, added a few weapons, but anything else that you see about this team that you like? Oh, absolutely. Listen, I, I like, first of all, they, they increased the team speed. You know, they got a lot, a lot more athletic. Um, they do have a lot of youth. They might be the youngest team in the league, um, you know, at the start of the season. But, you know, I, you know, if I'm a coach, I, I would be excited about coaching, you know, coaching, you know, these young guys up. Um, yeah, they might make you pull your hair out, but, you know, they got some really explosive guys. You know, Elijah Moore has kind of been the talk of training camp. Um, Michael Carter, the running back, has, has, been, has been really good in training camp. You know, Elijah Vera Tucker. I mean, I, I really like a lot of these rookies and and, and uh, these second year guys. And that's how you build a foundation for years to come. When you can get coach these guys up and and, and hopefully, you know, these guys, uh, as far as their play comes to fruition, boy, you will have a solid nucleus for for many years. Talking with Damian Woody here on DCR 98.7 ESPN. Mike T and I were just talking about it a little while ago on the show, Damian. Given the fact that this year the preseason is going to look a little bit different, you have the three games instead of four, you're the Jets, you have a rookie quarterback in Zach Wilson. You want to get him as many real NFL reps as possible, which you know would come in preseason before the regular season starts. If you're Robert Sala, how do you approach giving snaps to a rookie quarterback? And you want to guard against injury, of course, but you want to at least get him, you know, get his feet wet a little bit before the bullets start to fly for real. How do you distribute maybe his playing time here in the preseason? Well, I think the, I think in the, I think the first game, you know, he'll probably get a quarter, maybe a quarter plus. You know, second game, you you know, the second game is essentially like the third game used to be, where you play a half and maybe you know. A series, a series of two after halftime to you know make those adjustments, and then the third game, you know maybe give him another quarter. But the one thing about Robert Sala, you know that 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 he's talked about, and I've seen, and I've seen is that he preaches, you know, we want to do everything as far as game speed, game situations. That that's the only way that he's going to speed up that process is, is in whether it's in practice or in the preseason games, just feeling that rush. Uh, feeling the, you know, having a sense in these situations. So he's going to need reps in the preseason. He can't, it can't be a situation where, you know, he plays a series here and, you know, maybe a quarter here. He needs actual reps in these preseason games to help, you know, speed up the process. Hey, D. Wood, we, we're having an interesting conversation. Love to get your point of view on this, which is the whole idea of vaccinations. And more specifically, how would you handle it as a team leader when a couple of your players, for whatever reason, didn't want to get vaccinated. And do you think, take a team like Minnesota, do you think this issue could impact the season for teams this year? Yeah, Mike, you know, this is, you know, obviously this is a, you know, hotly talked about subject. And, and, and you know, you know, we always preach about football as the ultimate team sport and, and making sacrifices, um, doing things for the team. And, you know, so, you know, for me, you know, if I'm on a team and I'm a team leader, my message would simply be, listen, you know, we've invested so much into this season, you know, the, the training, uh, you know, the lifting, uh, you know, OTAs, mini camp, training camp. You know, why put yourself and put the team in a situation where 
we could be late in the season. You get tested positive, you, you test positive or in close contact with somebody who tests positive, and now we don't we we don't have you at a critical junction in the season. For me, it, the message would be team, team, team. You know, sacrificing for the team for the greater good of the team. But D, D would do you think that's? And we were talking about this earlier. Look, you know, I've had a lot of experience dealing with you know whatever injuries, holdouts, money, titles for coaches, whatever it may be. And I feel like there's like six or seven issues which you know you deal with over and over again. I felt like I was saying to Dan earlier that I think that this vaccine debate is slightly different because it's something you're putting in your body. Um, look, I've been vaccinated, but there are people that, for whatever reason, religious or otherwise, don't want to get it. And I think what you're saying is something I totally agree with. I know you live that about being selfless and being for the team, but I would just... To me, this is so interesting because this is like unlike any other issue we've ever dealt with because we're asking people to put something in their body that for whatever reason they may not be comfortable doing. Well, yeah, I, you know, that's that's exactly what it is. And it's just become so politicized, Mike. You know, that's the reason why it's such a hot topic issue. And, uh, you know, and that's unfortunate because I look at, you know, for me, you know, I'm just speaking for myself. You know, I tend to take the viewpoint of so many people who made this thing possible. You know, it, it's I look at it as a modern mir- miracle. And um, and so, again, for me, I just bring it back to the team. And I know ultimately people are going to do what they feel like is in the best interest, but, man, it would just be tough. You know, when we're, you know, in December, someone tests positive, and now you're out, I believe, the, I believe the, uh, for unvaccinated, it's like 10 days or something, mm-hmm. you got to quarantine or whatever it is. That's a tough blow. That's that's an extremely tough blow, you know, at any juncture in the season, let alone like late in the season, so if that scenario were to play itself out. No doubt about it. We'll see uh, how it's going to take shape the rest of the way. D. Wood, I know you got television here coming up soon. Always appreciate a couple of minutes, my friend. We'll do it again soon. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening to the DiPietro, Canty, and Rothenberg podcast. I have nothing left. <laughs> Hear more of DiPietro, Canty, and Rothenberg live weekday mornings from 5 to 8 a.m. on 98.7 ESPN in New York, the ESPN app, the TuneIn app, or on your smart speaker. Hey, Alexa, play ESPN New York 98.7.